Hi. Nice to meet you, Marlon. Where are you? I'm in New Hampshire. Oh, okay. That's a more reasonable hour. <laughs> right. Where are you? I'm in mountain time, so two hours behind you in Salt Lake City. Uh, yeah. <laughs> are you doing a presentation or just speaking? Um, I'm doing a presentation, but um, I, I mean, yeah, presentation. <laughs> I, I will speak, but it's uh, because the topic is so complicated. Hello. Hi, Lucy. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi, Night Owl. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's good to see. It's good to see you, Anne, and good to see you all. Yeah. Yeah. I have to apologize. I have strange lighting Quite because nice. it's still very dark here. And I don't have proper lighting for, <laughs> so it'll get better. No, we can we can see you. Uh, all right. Okay. You I think we it. all need to probably yeah. rename our. Uh, we go to the participant but, list and right. rename ourselves. Yep. Okay. We go to participants. Uh, Jyoti, can you see? Yeah. This is the new one? Yeah, this is the new one. Where do we name ourselves? Okay. I forget. Right click. I don't have right click. Uh, on the next to your name where it says more, if you click on more. Yeah. And, and you just go uh, to open the participant list and then uh, it should, then you should have those. And, um, which am I? 500. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. More rename. Okay. Great. I hope we, Dr. Kumari gets here soon. We'll have to help her change her name also. <laughs> In a way, she's a host. <laughs> yes. You want to call her? I did. I speak. I spoke with her a few minutes ago. She'll be online soon. Eight minutes. It's exciting. So, how are you guys? How's the vaccination slash COVID situation where you are? Good question. <laughs> yeah. What was the question? The question was how's the how's the vaccination situation going out from where we all are? Getting yeah. much better. We can. I ha I've had my first shot. Yay! Lucky you. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but they're opening up in my state. Everybody can get vaccinated probably by the end of May. Hmm. So that's good. That's great. You guys really need it. Yes. How about you, Lucy? Are you vaccinated yet? Oh, no. I'm a um, dirty, raging, unvaccinated person. <laughs> Which is okay. Super spreader. <laughs> well, we're still quite, we're still living quite distanced over here. Yeah. So and we don't have the yeah. great deal of community transmission or anything like that. So we're mm. in a very different situation, I think. Yes, <clears throat> better. I have a lot More of family Sydney, and the in general the situation is much much better. Mm. What Good. about you guys? Are you, are you both in India right now, the two of you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How, how's, how's, yeah. The, how's the situation there? Um. So in Delhi itself, um, it's a lot better than where what it was a few months ago. Although the cases are um, more than what it was last month. But vaccinations are happening. My parents are vaccinated now. And Good. so everyone who's 60 and above is like above. eligible and they're um, it's getting done. Good. Glad to hear that. Shruti, are you yeah. in New Delhi too? Yeah. Yeah. 
we've only just physically started going to office last month wow. after an entire year a so lot we're going back hey <laughs> i will be right back yes uh 6 minutes less than 6 minutes to go hi mm. and and what about you marlin isn't it yeah it's so good to meet you i i did i just had a big like in uh research of everything you do today um and yeah you're incredible really cool to to That's finally get to meet <laughs> It's so sweet of you to do that. Um, yeah, I, I. You do I, what you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Um, I mean, virtual activism started way, way back uh, in when the internet was still, you know, not very well known. So, I think uh, I think I started it. just in the right time. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And who knew that we'd be back here relying more than ever on digital, you know? Yeah. Can you imagine wow. this uh this pandemic without the digital uh aspect? Not at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't want to imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's a worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think especially for us I I don't know about you guys but work absolutely did not stop just because we could you know we had so many tools to carry on we we moved I think 90% of everything we do we could move online even a lot of community work that we did with in villages and with um the underprivileged communities mm. um it's amazing how well we could connect with them wow That's quite amazing with a population yeah. the size of your yes. population. Right. right. I think it was just a big fast forward. The pandemic just got us into that fast forward mode. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Jyoti, can I ask um when we present, you have the slides, will you operate the slides yes. and we just talk? Is that the idea? Yeah. we thought that would be more comfortable for you probably if we have um, that streamlined in one place so shruti is going to share the screen oh, cool. while i do most of the talking and uh, yeah so i was telling marilyn and i've already um, spoken with ann about how we're going to do this uh, i'll just quickly in a minute um, take you through kind of like a structure that we have in mind uh we start by introducing everyone and um, we say hi to so the participants can all um see, um see you and um know about you and then uh, starting with ann i direct a question to ann so she can talk for like 7 minutes and uh, if i'm not wrong and then we go on to um you lucy and then again uh, the points that you told me are important to you that's what i bring in and ask you about uh, moving then we move on to marilyn and then dr kumari so we do a first round of uh, 7 to 10 minutes of talking and presenting and then uh, each panelist and then round 2 we basically try to uh, ask you about recommendations one by one and i will come back to each one of you one by one again and then we take questions Cool. I hope that's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. So we have a few attendees now, Shruti. Yeah, we do. Uh, once it absolutely goes live on the countdown button, we'll have more. Hmm. I'm just going to turn my camera off for one minute and turn the lights sure. off as much as I can. Yeah. Is Dr. Kumari coming? Definitely, she is coming. I must okay, say, it was actually a little while me. back. She was having a little trouble with her uh, internet connection. Jyoti, so last minute things. Jyoti and yes. Dr. Kumari. I mean, uh, all of you together. Um, I just wanted to thank you for putting the panel together and for inviting us. To yeah. Speak well, so thank you. No, I want to thank all of you for accepting the invitation and come. Coming on board. This is such a privilege. Dr. Kumari is here. 
Hi. 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 Dr. Kumari, you're sideways. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let me let me just Yay, you know. that's better. <laughs> wow. Is this better? There's our beautiful friend. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How hello, are you? Hello. Wow, from across the world. Can you imagine? We are from one side of the world to the other. Yes. yes. All together this evening. And I hope timing is okay for every one of you. It's fine. Yeah? Yeah. For you, it's too early. No? No. Hey, hi. Not for me. <laughs> hi, Lucy. <laughs> hi. It's so good to see you. I've missed, I've missed you guys. It's, it's incredible to not have <laughs> Not have seen each other for so long. Yeah, I know it's been so long. I think soon we are going to. Be, I got my vaccination, so I think very soon we will be able to travel and be able to meet each other. Ah, oh, yeah. no. it'll be so <laughs> yeah. Hi, hello, oh, Merlin. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. So good to see everyone here. My God, this is really. And I'm very happy that we have managed to pull off the CSW for the UN Women to provide such large network for so many people to join in. Right. Uh, yeah, so they really, our program looks like very popular because they had to sell out everything and they are now making people wait in the waiting list. So hopefully the waiting list people will get a chance to join in. Jyoti, just sound us when we have to start. We can't be delayed, no? Jyoti, can you hear me? Hey, Jyoti. I think that oh. video got paused. Just a second. Hey, Jyoti. So let me introduce Jyoti is our you know, program lead on our uh, social media. And uh, Shruti is the one who is managing all those trainings of thousands of students across the country. Yay. So we have uh, yeah, lots of team members are here. And as and then we they come up with questions we are going to introduce. Hopefully they'll all get chance. They are showing 500 join already, so we can oh. I think start. Yeah, it's a yes. lot. It's Hello. Still the first day. Everybody is <clears throat> excited. So um, it's time to begin, and um, let's start. Sure, yes. Okay. I would like uh, formally like to say hello and welcome to Center for Social Research event. CSR is a United Nations Economic and Social Council member and we hold our event every year at the UNCSW. This year, our discussion will revolve around digital safety and citizenship development. I would like to also take this opportunity to introduce the work we do in this field at the Center for Social Research India. And we have a small mission prepared. Uh, Shruti, if you could just share it. Um, so we, um, we have interacted in person with more than 100,000 young adults. We can hear you, Jyoti. Yeah, uh, I was just waiting for Shruti to uh, share. Yeah, it's sharing. sharing it. It's already She's there. It already. Go ahead. Okay. okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. So, we have interacted in person with more than 100,000 young adults on issues of online safety through our project Social Surfing in partnership with Facebook for almost a decade now. Since last year, we have targeted our training workshops towards an even younger audience of school students ages 13 to 17. Also, we work extensively with, with various stakeholders on the issues of women's safety in public spaces. And as the internet is the new public space, we have very naturally brought this space into focus with regard to safety, especially for women and children. We at CSR aim to influence policy with our advocacy for civic participation of women and children, which is why we are here today to bring strength to our voice by forming a global alliance with our panelists and building a strong dialogue for the way forward. 
So here goes. Uh, let us welcome our learned panel today, whose voices matter. With us today are Ms. Anne Collier, a writer and youth advocate, and has been chronicling the public discussion about youth and digital media since 1997. She is the founder and executive director of the U.S. national nonprofit organization, the Net Safety Collaborative, which runs Net Family News and has piloted social media helplines for schools across California. She is one of many major digital media advisory boards, including Facebook. We have with us Marilyn Tedros. She is the founder of Virtual Activism and its pro project Mengos, Middle East NGOs Center for Knowledge Society, both of which are pioneering projects that dealt with the intersection between technology and human rights and development. We also have with us Lucy. Thomas has been empowering school students to stand up to bullying, hate, and prejudice for over a decade now through her unique, globally recognized initiative, Project Rocket. Through the lens of cyberbullying, her work explores themes of inclusion, respectful relationships, social leadership, diversity, values and ethics, and empathy. We have our very own Dr. Ranjana Kumari, a renowned social activist and a prolific academician. She is a director of Center for Social Research. She has dedicated her life to empowering women across South Asia region and is also a prolific writer for many well-known publications. She's named one of the 100 most influential people in gender policy in A Political's list alongside people such as Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Michelle Obama. She is an integral part of our say of the safety advisory board and council of major international stakeholders on, of the online space, both nationally and internationally. Okay, so the format of today's discussion would be as follows. Each speaker will have five to seven minutes to talk and present their inputs about the main discussion topic, which is digital safety and civic participation and their core area of expertise after which we shall moderate a discussion. Participants can write their questions, if any, in the chat box, along with their email addresses, which at the end of the discussion will be directed to the panelists if time permits. Otherwise, we will email replies individually after the event. So let me welcome you, Anne, and for the purposes of beginning our discussion, in your experience of working with the youth, what should be the prime focus of all stakeholders and the full range of children's rights? Thank you, Jyoti. And it's so great to be here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I think I'm going to answer the question with a little bit of a story. And just in case that might be helpful, a little bit of history, perhaps. So I've watched the online safety field evolve since 1997 as Jyoti said in my introduction, and when our Supreme Court struck down the first internet legislation that the US Congress passed, um, that was back a couple of decades now, and the court struck down this law called the Communications Decency Act because the justices said it violated our constitution's free speech amendment. All that was left of the law was section 230, often called the law that created the modern internet, but that's another story. So ever since 1997, we and many societies have experienced this tension between internet users' freedom of expression and their protection, starting with that of children and youth, the first vulnerable group of users to be recognized by societies around the world. Now we recognize many more. Vulnerable is the operative word. It's that perceived vulnerability and fears and concerns about harm that quite understandably has defined internet safety's first nearly 25 years. Scholars call it moral panic. In 2010, 10 years after the first research on youth online safety was published in the US, its lead author, Dr. David Finkelhor, director of the Crimes Against Children Research Center at the University of New Hampshire, coined the term juvenoia. I'll just pause on that for a second. Note that it's a play on paranoia, 
and Dr. Finkelhor defined it as the exaggerated fear of the impact of social and technological change on youth. In a paper and talk that year, 2010, he pointed to US federal data tracking more than a dozen social problem indicators involving youth since the World Wide Web went mainstream in our country. Sexual exploitation, bullying, substance abuse, depression, school violence, teen pregnancy, and so on, and all of them, except for obesity and children living under the poverty line, were down since the earliest days of the web. He didn't say the numbers were down because of the internet, but they obviously had not gone up because of it. So <clears throat> why am I telling you all this? Well, because the very director of a prestigious research center on crimes against children was suggesting we went way too far with our internet fears. We need to strike a balance so that fear does not define children's online experiences. A few years later, Dr. Sonia Livingstone at the London School of Economics, a founder of the EU Kids Online and now Global Kids Online Research Projects, wrote about the three Ps of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Children's rights of provision and participation as well as protection. And then fast forward to 2017 and Professor Amanda Third at Western Sydney University, an international expert on youth consultation and digital practice, joined Livingstone in writing that, quote, over and again, efforts to protect children unthinkingly curtail their participation rights and their ability to realize the opportunities the internet affords. Since then, research done in three countries has pointed to a quote, paradigm of control and surveillance that has developed around youth internet safety in many countries through overemphasis on monitoring, blocking and other parental controls rather than mentoring our children's media use. In effect, teaching our children that surveillance and external control are what keep us safe. This is more akin to digital dictatorship than digital citizenship. So I suggest that the UN Convention is the perfect framework for youth online safety because it establishes that balance they need and deserve. And because it provides for three-way protection, self, peer, and adult-enabled protection, especially since, and the Committee for the Rights of the Child last month published the general comment number 25 on youth digital rights. So we're right up to date. And as we develop programs for their education and protection, we might consider how essential their agency, their capacity to act and affect change and their participation are to protecting themselves, their peers and their communities online and offline. Protection isn't just something, you know, in, in, posed from above, right? It is, it's especially important because online safety is highly individual, situational, and contextual. Protection as well as provision and participation are a collective, collaborative endeavor and include actualization and empowerment as well as resilience. I hope that societies newer to online safety will do much better than my own country has in honoring and developing young people's own capacities as Lucy and Project Rocket are in Australia and you'll hear from her next. So because I, I've truly seen that we have as much to learn from our young people as they do from us and from each other. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for that Anne. Um, Juvenia, yes, that's something we did uh, pause on and we did and we still are going too far with our fear and although we mean well in our intention to protect our children, we've often, uh, you know, um, left their rights of participation behind um, and you're right, you, they need agency and they need capacity building to act and to participate. We greatly, we really appreciate your inputs here. And, and so uh, moving on to you, Lucy. Hi. 
um, what are your thoughts on Anne's inputs here? And since you two work closely with the youth, what are your thoughts on the subject of children's digital safety, the impacts of online violence, balancing safety um, and regulation and pursuing intersectional equality? I believe you have a presentation ready, uh, which we are going to share now for better understanding of these points. Um, Shruti, if you would please, thanks. Thank you so much. And, and I think you and I are the perfect kind of complement in talking about these issues. So there's no big surprises here. I hope to follow on um, from that awesome presentation and reflection and share some kind of practical insights about how we can realize a new approach to online safety that's actually empowering for the people that you know we're, we're trying to protect. Um, so for context, my name's Lucy and I'm one of the co-founders of Project Rocket, which is Australia's youth-driven movement against bullying, hate and prejudice. And you can jump to the next slide. Um, I'm coming to you from Australia and I want to start by doing something that we do all over the country in Australia at the start of every workshop we run at Project Rocket. I want to acknowledge the land that I'm coming to you from. Um, I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Australia, which is the land, the Aboriginal land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So I want to start by paying my respect to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge this land that I'm on and the resilience of Aboriginal people um, all over Australia as well. I think talking about an issue like bullying, it's really important to acknowledge that history of the land that we come from. You can jump to the next slide. Um, which is actually a video. And before, before we quickly share the video, I, I thought that it might be helpful just to share this because it gives a bit of a snapshot of the work that we do at Project Rocket. So I don't have to talk about Project Rocket if I just share the video with you. Um, and it shares a little bit about how the last 15 years of building this youth-driven movement have framed my views of the kind of significant social impact we can co-create when we make young people that as our chief architects of change. So we can play the video now. We're Rosie and Lucy, the sisters who started Project Rocket fresh out of high school. Project Rocket is built on a simple dream of a world where kindness and respect thrive over bullying, hate and prejudice, and all young people are free to realise their potential. So since starting small, Project Rocket has now positively impacted hundreds of thousands of young Aussies all over the country. So how does it work? Well, Project Rocket empowers school students to stand up and lead change at school, online and beyond. And we do this in a few different ways. First up, face-to-face -face workshops. The difference between these workshops and other workshops is it's actually engaging. They really get issues that are actually happening to you. They have social media as well and they understand where you're coming from. Online workshops. After the online workshops, I felt really empowered to tackle bullying. Project Rocket's message is made a lot more powerful because it's made by young people for young people. I feel like I'm more comfortable talking to other people and my friends about things I'm going through. And we have Project Rocket TV, which is a YouTube series is all about giving a voice to the things that young people really do want to talk about at school. When it comes to bullying, either you're part of the problem or part of the solution. So join Project Rocket in getting behind young Aussies to create the future that every person deserves. So as you can see, we've had a lot of fun building Project Rocket and I'm really lucky that I get to see the best of young people in the work that we do. Um, I'll also acknowledge that we're charged with addressing some pretty significant social issues that fall under the umbrella of bullying, hate and prejudice that as we know, bubble and flow throughout our communities online and offline, and in some ways have been even widened by the pandemic. So I just wanted to start by acknowledging the kind of full array of digital harms that do occur and that we're, we're trying to kind of address in this kind of conversation. So when we're talking about digital harms, Project Rocket addresses cyberbullying, but really we're also talking about a much wider range of issues like image-based abuse, or family violence or domestic violence that's facilitated through technology. Uh, we're talking about online hate speech right through to the exploitation of children online, as well as the misuse of personal information and of course, cyberbullying. 
Um, so the impacts of this harm, especially when it affects young young people and young women, include, uh, we'll just stay on that last slide for just a moment if that's okay. Those impacts include lower school attendance and performance, increased stress and anxiety and, you know, kind of personal anguish, as well as feelings of isolation. We, you know, when we're experiencing harm online, we experience poor concentration. At times it might result in a decrease in our self-esteem and our confidence. And of course, as we often hear about in the media, in extreme cases, cyberbullying can lead to suicide. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that this kind of, these kind of behaviours don't affect all people equally, and that's part of the conversation we're here to have today. So the reality is some people are at greater risk of experiencing online harms than others. I'm talking women, uh, LGBTIQA plus people, people with a disability, Indigenous peoples, and culturally in, and linguistically inverse, diverse folks as well. So... That's why it's really important that we also consider the flow on effects for those communities when it comes to online harm. I'm talking economic costs, right through to personal financial loss. Um, there might be family impacts. There may be also threats, especially when it comes to women, to our political and civic participation as well. So that's why I wanted to pull up this slide. Because traditionally, when we think about young people's online experiences, we tend to weigh up two categories the good parts and the bad parts. And ideally, we want to make sure that people are having the good parts without the bad parts. So as you can see on the left hand side of the screen, we, I've got a list of some of the harms and risks that play out um, online that we might be worried about. So we're talking about social isolation. We might be worried about young people being too dependent on technology. We might be worried about negative mental health effects, exposure to harmful or inappropriate content, predators, and of course, cyberbullying. You know, at the same time, though, we want to ensure that we get the good parts of technology, including community and civic participation, participation and access more broadly, um, new avenues for support, critical thinking, finding your voice, and of course, the, the development of resilience, the ability to bounce back. Now, the problem with this kind of model where we're trying to separate out the good and the bad is that online, actually, it's not super realistic to look at these experiences in this way. You know, take the top line, for example, we might be worried about social isolation, but if we don't take the risk of allowing people to go online, we'll never find out whether we'll realise our opportunity for community and civic participation. So the two are kind of inextricably bound. On the bottom line, you can see we might be worried about cyberbullying, but actually cyberbullying, while it can be a horrible experience, a lot of young people recognise is a really important avenue to developing their sense of resilience and critical thinking as well. So the problem is that often these harms and benefits really exist side by side and they're kind of inextricably linked. So, you know, actually, what we may end up doing when we're trying to protect people from the harms and risks, we may actually end up cutting them off from the opportunities and benefits. And this is kind of the piece that Anne was just trying, you know, trying to really flesh out for you now. So the reality is, and this is why I've reframed this list, the more time we spend online, the more likely we are to encounter both the harms and the risks and the benefits and opportunities. So if we start to look at some degree of experiencing all of what the online world has to offer, the good and the bad, it kind of can start to reframe our conversation. You know, we spend so much time focusing on the harms, but actually by protecting young people, we're missing an opportunity to equip them, you know, with the skills to navigate those harms. You know, we often end up solely just protecting young people and not developing those skills. So the questions that I'm interested in are, how can we equip people who are most impacted by online harms, those groups that I named before, with the ethics to make healthy decisions? How can we start to develop the resilience to grow back? How can we start to mobilize, mobilize our communities in solidarity so that people experience support when they're going through a difficult time? How can we grow empathy? How can we develop the ability to self-regulate? So this is where I wanna to jump to the next slide and suggest that it's time for us to move from a model of protection to a model of empowerment. And these are two students outside of Project Rocket Workshop having just had exactly that experience. So there's a number of ways that we can do this. 
my suggestions i've got four really simple strategies that we can use to build empowerment for young people so first up rather than focusing on protection and safety i think we can really start to turn the table and focus on equipping young people with the tools to safely manage their own online experience so we're, we're starting to look towards a model of agency rather than a model of protection Next up, by including peers in education, by including the actual peer group that's going to be there and witness these experiences of online harm, we can actually build solidarity and community so that when people do experience harm, they're wrapped in a community that can actually support them through difficult times. The next recommendation is that we start to include young people in decision making and policy development. So that might mean setting up youth advisory groups in the organizations that we're building or brains trust to decide the kind of policies that we're setting up. And Anne mentioned before the work of Amanda Third, and that's a great example of including young people, you know, actually in the co-design of research even that is going to shape policy as well. So there's a great opportunity there. And finally, I think it's so important that we acknowledge that, you know, all of these issues are social issues that are playing out online. You know, there, there isn't an algorithm to fix misogyny. There isn't a button you can click to make hate go away. So it's important now more than ever that we address the root social causes of online harms, such as misogyny, racism, and other forms of prejudice. And I can acknowledge that, you know, one of my mentors, Dr. Kamari, who's here with us today, has been addressing these for many, many years. So what we're seeing now are social issues playing out in online spaces. And it's time that we started treating these as social issues. And that means including men in these conversations as well about the risk that women face online. This means including the wider community rather than just looking at how LGBTIQ folks can, can protect ourselves. So yeah, I'll jump to the next slide and I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up shortly. Just to say, where can this happen? Where can this work take place? Well, first of all, it can take place in our schools and that, you know, there are a lot of great organizations around the world doing work like the work that we do to build peer support and peer led education in schools. We can also do this in our legal frameworks and we need to see policymakers really setting the scene for the kind of practice that we want to see and for the kind of tools that can really set up young people to control their own online experience. And I'll just say quickly that there's some new work, I think, coming out from Instagram that's really going to highlight some of those new tools that young people can have to navigate their experience of inappropriate interactions so that they can actually have agency, which is super cool. Of course, in our homes, thinking about how we can role model um, positive behaviours with the young people in our lives. And I'm not just talking about you know, balancing screen time and, uh, you know, like not using your phone at the dinner table. I'm actually talking about having really nuanced conversations about how we engage with people who fundamentally have different views to us. Uh, thinking about how we can navigate some of the more complex conversations of our time that we're seeing playing out. And finally, on our screens. And yeah, this is, a, this is a really exciting way that I think young people can control the conversation themselves by choosing to curate their news feeds. And we're seeing this play out all over the world with, you know, the rise of movements that support body positivity, you know, that elevate the voices of women of colour. You know, we're seeing the ways that LGBTIQA plus voices are front and centre, despite the fact that on mainstream television, they may still not be represented. So just recognising the potential for technology to actually create these avenues participate, for participation. And I might leave it there, but yeah, those are my comments. I'd love for you to stay in touch with Project Rocket and really looking forward to the rest of this conversation. Yeah, great. Um, Thank you for this, Lucy, and a world where kindness, respect, thrive over bullying, prejudice, and hatred. Isn't that what we all want? Um, and I, I, my, my key to take away from what you, um, your speech would be that there's a great need to uh, move from protection to empowerment of young people. That is also um, at the very core of what we do at CSR. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Lucy. And um, now coming to you, Marilyn, we would love your thoughts on the inputs shared till now. Uh, also as a specialist in this field, we have your presentation on safety of women and the part intermediaries play. Um, and we'll be sharing that now. 
Uh, thank you, Jyoti, and thank you to the center for um, for inviting me. Um, I I am very very uh, pleased that I'm here. Um, I want to say that I normally don't do PowerPoint presentations in my classes in school, um, but I thought that because there are some technical terms, <clears throat> it might be a good idea to just uh, have them there for anybody who wants to read them. Um, but, uh, but I'd rather you kind of focus on um, some of the explanations. Um, I have to say that the summary of what I'm going to say right now is what Lucy said uh, at the very end, which is moving from um, the model of, of protection uh, and agency to the model of empowerment. Um, I think this is very important and uh, it really is the summary of, of even my presentation. Um, <clears throat> So my, my, uh, my presentation is called Intermediary Liabilities and the Protection of Women and Be Careful What You Wish For. Now I say be careful what you wish for because sometimes we have these knee-jerk reactions. Let's put regulations, let's uh, ban, let's prevent, let's, um, let's close and it's, uh, it's it's not the correct uh, response. <clears throat> so what are intermediaries? So uh, can, yeah. An intermediary is really anybody who provides um, or hosts or publishes any content. So uh, your ISP uh, or the service providers uh, and other things were added to it uh, in, in recent times, including hosting um, sites, including um, things like uh, Netflix, things like uh, YouTube, things like anything that provides content is considered an intermediary. Um, to date, intermediaries were given what we call a safe harbor. A safe harbor is um, that they, the intermediaries are not responsible for the content that is published on their site. And then people started to say, no, there is hate speech, there is racism, there is all of these things, uh, there's violence against women. Um, we need to put some form of regulations. So the intention is very good. Uh, yes, we need these, these protections. Um, next slide, please. So yes, uh, we're protecting children, protecting against hate speech, etc. cetera. Um, even protection from terrorism, right? So next slide. Now I'll tell you uh, three a story of three women. Um, they're not fully hypothetical, okay? They, they are cases that actually happened. So um, a woman is harassed online uh, and abused online. And then offline, uh, this leads to violence against her offline. That's one woman. And I'm sure you're aware of many cases of, of such women. In fact, this is one of the biggest things is that it doesn't stay only at um, online, it moves to the physical world as well. Another story is about a woman activist subjected to abusive comments online, uh, but after further investigation, it is discovered that the abusers are from another country. Okay, if I'm holding intermediaries, local intermediaries, if I put guidelines locally, uh, because, you know, all these intermediaries are global. We're talking about cross-Atlantic, we're talking about transatlantic, we're talking about transnational uh, organizations. 
and big organizations. So what, even if you put local, um, local guidelines, it doesn't apply to everybody uh, on the transnational level. <clears throat> um, a third example is, okay, a government does not like a female activist and her feminist movement. And uh, it asks an intermediary to take down the content that is published by her because it conflicts with religion, with culture, with whatever kinds of beliefs they have. So this again is another case. I'm sure you've seen these cases and I can name names, but there are so many cases um, of, of things happening now. Again, uh, we don't want to get into the slippery slope. All right, so next, yep. Um, the slippery slope is, like I said, the knee-jerk reaction, okay? Um, we have many problems that arise from this uh, slippery slope. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm not going to read them all, but I want to focus on a few. So for example, uh, giving control to these companies. Uh, they were not responsible for content before, but now we're telling them, no, we want you to be responsible for content. So what happens is, okay, I am Facebook. I decide to, uh, I don't like this content because it disagrees with certain things that I believe in, I take it down. Um, what is unlawful content? How is it defined? Uh, and again, how is it defined transnationally, not just locally? Um, there are cultural differences that, that you know, you, you need to take down uh, content from one place uh, because, of, because let's say China doesn't like it or or India doesn't like it, or somebody in the Middle East doesn't like it, um, but it's acceptable in other areas. So where do we uh, draw the line here? Another thing is, uh, one of the important things is that the, the new intermediary guidelines, especially uh, the ones that were recently implemented in India, um, override encryption and encourage traceability. And I think that this is one of the biggest problems there because if you override encryption, you are threatening even the women that we're trying to protect. Uh, because a woman could go, you know, uh, have, have an, uh, an encrypted email, let's say between me and Jyoti and I'm talking to her and uh, on encrypted email, and then I find that somebody has access to it. Um, it also encourages traceability, so they want to know who. It, it removes the concept of anonymity online. And while this has its benefits, it also has um, very, very dire consequences. Um, a woman who is abused, would like, might like to go um, online to, to complain, but without giving her name and because it will endanger her. Now, if we have traceability, we can trace who this woman is. And in fact, we can these days. Okay, next. Um, so there are remedies. Uh, some of these remedies uh, most of the remedies so far have been flawed remedies. Um, we can talk about the legal remedies. Yeah, I, I just talked about legal remedies. Uh, there, it's not a very good idea to immediately go to the law for protection. Um, I think that we have enough laws on the ground in the physical world whereby we can apply them to the people who are um, abusing, apply them to, uh, uh, to protect the women, etc. 
The social and cultural are very, very important because, again, like Lucy said, uh, we really need that that empowerment of and and awareness raising uh, for everybody. Now, um, again, in in um, the the technological part is really uh, the one that a lot of people are going after. And by technological uh, remedy is, okay, let's have, and this is what companies are doing because they will not sit and read every single post that's happening on their, on their site. So there are algorithms that they, uh, they are designing that will make, um, that will make the, uh, the, the sorry <laughs> uh, there are algorithms that will be anti-biased there are algorithms that you know people are trying to create these different um, algorithms to help uh, in in curbing uh, the the abuse online but the problem is as you can see for example here's an example this model um, she's a black model. Uh, she was very famous. Um, algorithmically, Instagram took it down because it considered this pay, this image a nude image. Uh, and and there are many other cases like that. But I have to say that um, there is, for example. Uh, some attempts at making the the bias less um, how do we call it uh, not less obvious um, but at least having some uh, hate speech list okay so there is a project that is called Hate Base, um, and I would like you all to, to see it. Uh, the Hate Base is called, it's a Hate Base database. It, uh, it's from Canada. Um, and uh, a person, uh, they've created data sets of words that they should not, um, that should not, that are abusive that are uh, violent, uh, that are racist, etc. And they're asking that anybody who sees these kinds of words report them to the hate-based database. Um, and, and so this will help the, the algorithm creators to differentiate between uh, these, um, uh, what is acceptable speech and what is not. Um, again, the, their, if it's left only to algorithms, remember that there is a social context as well. So let me give you an example. Um, there were, there was an issue about uh, bare-breasted uh, Black Africans, um, slave pictures. There's a big issue about it and some people wanted it taken off the internet. Uh, and in fact, if I have a, a, an algorithm, it's going to take it down because these are nude people. Okay. But there is a context. There is a social context for it. Uh, there is a political context for it that an algorithm cannot uh, discern or cannot understand. So this adds to the difficulty of it. Um, here are uh, uh, one, one example that I want to uh, talk about very quickly before I, I close is um, uh, one second, I'm trying to find it because it's a very important example. Uh, yeah, it, recently there was, very recently actually, there was a case of a woman, um, of, of a 
an app that was created uh, that is on WhatsApp and that is on uh, uh, other te Telegram. And this app makes the, the, you can take this person and uh, any person and make them nude. And, uh, and so a lot of women have been harassed this way because their pictures are taken just an innocent picture of a face of a woman and then they are immediately made into these nude women and it's it goes viral online and the app itself went viral and it was banned by telegram it was banned by whatsapp um, but of course even if you ban there are ways of getting back to it, um, of, of having access to it. Um, so again, taking down is not always the solution, but there are laws. So if I take the app creators legally, I can, I can work through that. Uh, here, are, here are some solutions. Uh, Google itself has um, uh, a reporting methodology where you can uh, report uh, abusive content and they will take it down. So they, uh, there is a notification and takedown approach. Anything that violates the law needs to be taken down immediately. And I'm talking about the physical world. Um, we need to go back to the Manila principles and I will show you uh, what the Manila principles are if you're not aware of it. Um, but most importantly, in, in my opinion, is keeping a rights framework in mind when we're seeking solutions. So what does a keeping a rights framework mean? It means I have to abide by the 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 all of the rights that we have been uh, we have fought for and that are now sanctioned by um, by the UN uh, including the uh, Universal Declaration and others so if we keep these uh, this framework in mind freedom of speech right to privacy right to security uh, etc then we can go from there and uh, start empowering women uh, and uh, that's it. Uh, the next slide is just the six Manila principles. If you want to read them, they're online. You can just put the Manila principles. Um, I think we should go back to that. I think they were great principles and um, we shouldn't overreach. Thank you very much. Thank you for this, Marilyn, for clearly explaining the problem, how local regulations might not work with global intermediaries, problems of defining unlawful content, overriding of encryption in India. That's a big issue here. Traceability and effects of, safe, of traceability on the safety of women and the algorithmic bias, that too. Um, Coming to you, uh, Dr. Ranjana Kumari, finally, um, to add to what Anne had brought up in terms of children's rights and Lucy spoke to us about her work and strategy. And like Marilyn spoke about, about stakeholders, uh, like the intermediaries, we would like your uh, perspective and we would like to know your thoughts on women's dwindling participation, which is another issue that we face greatly in India and globally also. Thank you, Jyoti, and thank you to my co-panelists for making my job very easy because they have really underlined all the major issues that we at the moment are confronting and need to look at more deeply. Uh, most important thing to understand what the digital world looks like. I think digital world at the moment has almost, uh, you know, uh, almost 46%, 40, you know, 50, sorry, 56 percent people who are online and are participating in the digital world, that globally, which would mean almost over 4.5 billion people in out of 7 
something odd billion people that we are globally, uh, almost they're all online in some or the other form on social media. So they are digitally connected. But the issue at the moment is that who are these people who are digitally connected and who are the people who are really being able to um, take advantage of this uh, digital citizenship that we are talking about? And what are the uh, conditions and perspectives that uh, really we understand when we say immediately digital citizenship? I think when we say citizenship, we do understand our own uh, you know, physical boundaries of the nation, the constitution, the rights that just now um, uh, was talked about. We understand the constitutional guarantees, but when you look at the digital platforms and you are talking about digital citizenship, then we really have to see who really is going to ensure all that or who's ensuring it. Because what is offline, what is socially happening to people in the world is also happening online in a many, many big ways. So uh, for example, women's exclusion or not only just women's exclusion, politically excluded people or, or people who are culturally socially excluded or people who are really within the citizenship rights within the nation are ex excluded people are also excluded from online in a big way. Whereas I, I think this space is democratic. This space is free for everyone. This place could have been extended to everyone. But Women only are, you know, for example, let me tell you South data, Global South or South Asia data, that there are only 27% women who are using Facebook at the moment, vis-a-vis -vis the men. Now, if, if that's the situation, or you can say only 23% overall participating in the digital world. If that is the situation, that means women are really excluded. So let's get into the reasons for exclude, exclusion. I don't think I need to dwell more on political, social, and cultural reasons for exclusion. You know, that is control mechanism that works on a female body through patriarchal system and norm. And very nicely said by uh, Lucy and also Madeline that, you know, this whole empowerment paradigm pa framework, because when you talk about protection, who's going to protect, protect whom? So this is again within the patriarchal framework that we are thinking of protecting. You make some people so excluded, so deprived, so dependent. You make some people so fearful that you need to protect them. So who will protect them? The ones who have the power will protect them. You know. So protection, discussion on protection itself is something which excludes women. The, because you create such fear and that's what happened when digital world opened up to everyone that so much of fear was presented that, you know, you will be uh, shown nude, you will be uh, bullied, you will be, of course, these are reality. I'm absolutely not denying that this is not happening, but then how do you empower people who are already, uh, you know, disempowered, excluded, uh, who are not really, um, you know, having the courage to be part of this, who does not have the agency to be part of it. So this is what happened to women when they got excluded. To top it all, women have always been hesitant in using new technologies. Always look at the agriculture technology, look at the industrial technology, look at whichever. When the technological revolution came, women got left behind. Why? Because women really did not get A, access, B, training and knowledge, and C, that women also did not really get any kind of you know, uh, effort to build their capacity and skill to use that technology. So I think that's something which really uh, has created this exclusion of women. Uh, so it is access, it is knowledge, it is control over technology. It is also in many ways, the whole digital technology uh, came as a, you know, real, uh, what do you call it? A new, uh, opened a new arena to the whole, uh, you know, global citizenship. So as a result, women really got left behind. In any case, when you look at the political leadership of women, where are they? They are again at this 23% or 27%. So online also they are 27%. When you look at the women in the industrial leadership or in the, you know, there's a fight about women on the boards, where are women? Same percentage, close to the same. So same way women are really not being included and there has not been enough effort, I must say, from the intermediaries, from the governments, and from the, of course, the other independent players in this whole thing to bring more women online and to bring, because the pandemic really has uh, given us a lot of scope and a lot of hope 
of course, where there is a lot of despair and people have really lost lives and we have not been able to, you know, come and now with vaccine, we are at top of it, but we have not been able to really do much about it. But I think it's also given some kind of a hope for the future because women could take a lot of advantage during this period in terms of building their knowledge about so medical connectedness that help women leave the misinformation aside. Uh, that's another story that we must talk about uh, in this discussion. Then they got a lot of uh, you know, knowledge and information. They also could survive and promote whatever small enterprise and business that they were doing through connecting with the clients through this. So it made a good sense for e-commerce during this period for a lot of women. They also managed their household and children and all kinds of uh, responsibility because they engaged in e-commerce and some data talks about women are better researchers when they go for e-commerce. They are better users of e-commerce. They bought much more than men bought during this period through e-commerce. So I think in every which way, when you look at the way digital world has helped women uh, during this period, needs to be extended in the in and now in our own thought process. Instead of just talking about the uh, fear, uh, certainly there is uh, it's real. Fear is real and we have to deal with that platforms will have to come up with their uh, you know mechanisms uh, just declaring their own uh, policies and their own uh, you know community standards are not enough uh, they are doing that as we understand from discussions on twitter and facebook safety board we understand that they are, they are doing trying to do a lot but i feel there's a lack of governments waking up to this call our own national governments they they are really not prepared with good robust laws and policies to protect the city as they would protect their citizens they're not protecting the citizens online and especially women online a uh, lot needs to be said about that to have good policies and laws by the countries to be able to uh, bring this whole uh, thing in, in 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 proper perspective now just just because since we have to move to the next round of the discussion i just want to um, talk about three fundamentals that cannot be, whether it is offline, online, uh, cannot be compromised and cannot be really uh, you know, looked at. Uh, if, since it is global, it is digital, it, 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 it is different than what is national, what is constitutional, what is democratic. I think one is the space has to remain democratic. Nobody is going to control this space. The, 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 as long as you're not controlling the space, people will have their own say. And I I'm really liking Madeline's idea that, you know, who's going to control the content? You know, who's going to define what is, you know, of course, there are some obvious wrong contents, but normally, why should you block people who are raising their voices in different systems? Democracies allow that, and people have been on the streets and protection, but why should online all of a sudden you block everyone who's trying to raise a voice against whichever is the government in power? in that particular country. Number two, so democratic space has to be democratic for women to participate. Number two, equality cannot be compromised. At no cost, women will be left behind and the systems can move on just like our nations have moved on. And number three, which is much more than anything uh, is important that we need to look, look at women's participation in online spaces through the prism or you can say through the understanding or through the framework, let me quote Lucy back, is through the empowerment framework. And this is what has been our commitment for four decades. We have worked on this. We don't like this protection uh, format where you want to first you know, uh, bully uh, women, uh, uh, try to send rape threats, and then you say, oh, we are developing enough mechanism for you to protect. So I think this is something which needs to be also coming from the human rights empowerment perspective. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anjana Kumari, for talking about exclusion, access, control, and capacity building, and which is, uh, you know, uh, with respect to women's safety, is a multi-stakeholder responsibility. And also talking about how there's hope, um, that really caught me. And um, as much as the intermediaries are responsible, so is the state. The government needs to create robust laws and protect women and create conditions to encourage access. Um, again, thank you so much, uh, all of you.
Um, at this point, I would like to remind participants to write their questions in the chat box, please, with their email addresses to be taken up at the end of the discussion. Coming back to you, Anne, um, so to as a culmination of you know what everyone's spoken about and your thoughts, uh, what would be your main recommendations uh, with the view of safety of the youth online? Just realized I was muted, sorry. Um, several recommendations and I, I really see it as a thread through everything we've all said. Um, I think we need a human rights framework around safety for people of all ages, really. Um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child applies to people under 18, um, but there's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's interesting to see that most of the people Facebook put on, its, uh, on the oversight board that it created and is now spun off and is now an NGO, um, most of them are experts on human rights or have um, a fairly significant knowledge on the subject. So that's good. And I think that's so important, not just because of um, the provision, protection and participation balance, but also because um, governments don't really fully understand the technology that we're talking about. And I'm not sure our government, our lawmakers are gonna get up to speed even though they have very, very smart um, legal minds on their staffs. Um, they seem to just um, hark back constantly to um, political issues um, rather than fundamentals. Um, so I think we have to not rely on platforms, not rely um, on governments, but really begin to uh, push for a human rights framework around all of this and all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Lucy, your work is such an inspiration and for the global community to have a stronger grasp on the situation and for a better way forward for positive engagement of the youth online. What should be key suggestions that come from you and your organization? Well, I, I don't want to reiterate what Anne said, although I'm in thorough agreement. I'd love to, if I can, try to incorporate some of the questions that have popped up in the chat. Um, just to think about, because I, I, there are a couple of questions maybe looking at people who experience, uh, who are more greatly impacted by online harm. So thinking about people with disabilities, there were questions about, you know, women specifically or LGBTIQ folks. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge that I think there's a real avenue for people who have historically um, and systemically been marginalised um, to mobilise online, which is a really exciting opportunity. At the moment in Australia, um, we've had a really unfortunate wave of um, political, I'm just gonna, political failures, I'm just going to name it for what it is, of men in political positions of power with some really high profile allegations um, of sexual assault and misconduct. And as a result today, all over Australia, we've had people taking to the streets with their daughters um, fighting for, you know, gender justice. Um, and just to think about the way that technology can create that, uh, that surge of mobilization, the way that it can elevate voices that need to be heard, I think is an exciting opportunity. Um, I've seen the way that the disability space has been transformed. So, you know, the way that people who traditionally may not be able to access going to these rallies, are uh, mobilizing new hashtags to have that voice and show up and um, exercise their their civic voice through technology as well. So I just wanted to name that I think there's a real avenue for us as women, um, but also more broadly to elevate uh, diverse communities. So I'm saying this as someone who is a white woman, um, I'm living on colonized land. So um, I benefit from those structures that exist. But one thing that's really exciting to me and that I'm, I humbly bow down to is the way that technology can redistribute that power that you know we're seeing around the world we're seeing the way this is happening and I think that there's an opportunity for all of us to play a role in that by listening by following accounts that educate and inform us um, and by elevating the voices of of other women especially women who are most impacted by these issues 
So you'll that's, take, yeah, that's a recommendation for me. Could I just quick follow up on that? Um, I, I think a thread that I see through all of this is that the context is not the internet. The context is not technology. It's our societies, it's our cultures. Um, if you just look at, for example, hate speech or bullying, especially with children, there's tremendous overlap between online and offline and um, the, the research has turned up. So we're really talking about life and culture, right? And social norms um, more than we are technology. And at least my generation, us older baby boomers, we, we seem to think that this is some sort of new alternate reality for which you know we need to develop new policies and laws when there are systems in place that just need to be enforced and applied, I think, to technology. Actually, I'm just going to jump in again, and I apologize if we're at risk of becoming a, a conversation between Anne and I, but only because it, I think this will also address uh, one of the questions in the chat that relates to this is the idea of um, scrambling to invent new policies and legislation to adapt to online spaces that actually don't address the root cause. Um, one of the questions was about Foster Sester, and for context, that is... Um, a piece of really groundbreaking and controversial legislation out of the US. Um, I believe FOSTA stands for the Fight Against Online Sex Trafficking Act and SESTA is something very similar, but it's a law that Trump passed in 2018, I believe, designed to, in theory, um, curtail online sex trafficking. Um, unfortunately, though, the effect that it's had because it wasn't necessarily considered um, in the long term is that it's created really unsafe conditions for a lot of women within the sex industry. So online um, and online spaces have actually been very important, not only for, the, for sex workers, but for lots of industries that um, traditionally aren't regulated or legislated. And unfortunately, what was designed to, um, I think, um, in theory was supposed to stop um, sex trafficking has actually created really unsafe conditions that have forced women onto the street um, who were having, you know, perfectly great business that they performed online. Um, and, you know, so I just, I, I realise that this is culturally sensitive as well, but I just wanted to name that this is the, this is an example of a law that hasn't been thought through in terms of the full implications. And when we rush to solutions that are legislative without consulting stakeholders, without asking women who are implicated in um, the decisions that are being made by largely um, male politicians, these are the kind of outcomes that we're going to find. They're going to be harmful. And, and they're not only going to be harmful for women, they're actually not going to have the design impacts for the communities they were designed to protect. Um, so really important that we include our stakeholders in our kind of decision making. I'll also just name that I'm very lucky to have um, some people in my life who are from the sex worker community who have educated me about these issues. And I just wanted to, to name that and, and honor that as well. I know that, yeah, this is, this is a global conversation and sensitive, but yeah, really wanted to honor the education they've given me. Amazing. I think, yes, this makes so much sense that it's not just um, um, the online space where we are inventing new uh, policy, but uh, as Anne said, um, um, the systemic problems in society, I believe the online space is a mirror of what is wrong with our society. It's just a reflection of what um, in general needs to be done. And yes, um, um, Lucy, this is so right. We are, how we are scrambling to, you know, invent new policy and it's doing more harm without research and without cons consulting with the communities. Yes. Um, and Marilyn, uh, since you've been working uh, for a long time on the intersections between technology and human rights, uh, what would be your main advice, you know, to us to adopt? Um, I think I said it all, um, specifically the, the, and everybody else said it as well. Um, it's, it's specifically um, raising awareness. It is um, using the human rights framework. I have to insist on that. Uh, using the human rights framework guarantees that uh, it guarantees free speech, it guarantees uh, protections and, uh, and empowerment, actually. 
Um, I just want to make a small comment um, that the laws are so different in different countries, uh, even regarding even regarding intermediaries. So, for example, between the U.S. and Europe, um, in the U.S., free speech is free speech, and in spite of um, attempts at closing it a, a little bit it is still protected. And, and we still have that wide margin of free speech. And free speech includes hate speech, unfortunately, but it's free speech. Um, Europe puts more restrictions on hate speech. Um, so for example, you can't talk about, um, you, you can't go online and talk about uh, Nazism, for example, although this is breaking down a little bit. Um, but the hate speech that leads to violence, this is my view, hate speech that um, leads to violence needs to be taken down. This is, this is my very personal view. If I see a speech that is inciting people to violence, then I need to take it down. But again, whose responsibility? I think it is the laws. So I think there are there, the, the local laws. It's like me standing out in, on the street and calling for violence. Um, I would be arrested most likely or not. I mean, in some places they will think I'm just a crazy woman standing there. Um, so I think that that speech that leads to violence, especially at this, um, remember again, it's transnational, which means it, it affects everybody. So, and everybody in, in different contexts and different cultures and people take things out of context completely um, and, and there could be a lot of violence. <laughs> and we've seen that uh, happen in the US uh, quite recently. So there is still that balance and I'm not quite sure yet how to resolve that except through, again, the rights framework. Yes, this uh, the human rights framework is what keeps coming up. Um, I believe we all believe in that. Um, Dr. Kumari, uh, when we talk about missing voices of women online, what do you think should be the best way forward to increase participation? Which direction specifically should our efforts go? I think strategies to bridge the digital divide, uh, gender digital divide, uh, should include first and the foremost thing is accessibility. I mean that's where women lose out in in uh, real life and also on online life that they don't have the access. I mean telephony is almost 99% penetration. But when you look at the smartphone and when you look at and when we looked at uh, you know this whole disruption. Uh, of COVID uh, disrupted the education, almost 1 billion uh, people got affected because of that. In India, we, uh, we have real life stories of girls, thousands of girls, millions maybe I would say, that they have, uh, they, they just could not continue their education. Their brothers got the phone to continue the education because all the classes became online, but the sister did not get the phone. So girls did not get the uh, smartphone. If there was one phone, it was given to the boy to continue the education, same thing. That if there is little money, you send the boy to school, but with uh, our right to education and a lot of campaign, girls are in school. So even, so, so access, access all the way to every uh, woman and girl to get, and second, then when you give access, you must give, uh, the capacity building of the uh, women to use the technology. It's not no point having the technology when you say, oh, I don't know how to use. Most of Indian parents will say, oh, my children teach me how to use this telephone. And, and, and. so I think it's very important that uh, that capacity of women has to be built. There has to be a conscious effort 
just like we are struggling to go get more women in India's parliament or global parliaments and senates, I think there has to be con conscious effort. And I see here role of platforms, very, very important role of platforms that they have to uh, start uh, building the positive image, how you can use it for, uh, you know, all kinds of e-commerce, economics, you know, all kinds of payment. And for example, I want to give one more example here that India has a system of direct uh, benefit transfer to the rural women in the rural areas where government is not giving money uh, to any intermediary but they are giving directly in the bank accounts of the women now they have to know how to go online and access this service same as for education similarly for employment when you are building the skills through our online courses we are we are uh, experiencing the uh, positive side of it is that women are able to get the education or are getting into the uh, employment so I feel that you know a lot of it has to do with building the capacity of women and online uh, intermediaries and service providers will have to then ensure that uh, internet connectivity is there, that they are, you know, even if it is direct connectivity, of course, India, we have had a big debate and we haven't still got uh, that uh, problem resolved, but I feel that there has to be access to internet, access to smartphones, and training into using the smartphones so the women can go there. And most of all, you know, you just have to create a kind of environment online where the sphere, mystery of the sphere dispel that, you know, you can confront it, you can fight back. Like we tell our girls, fight back. You know, don't just not get into a bus because you are pinch pushed and, um, you know, bullied, but you just get into the bus in groups in middle of the night and go and push them out. You know, this is what, is to be taught that you know the building of the confidence level of women online to make it not just 27 percent but 100 percent women should go online and start using and making a digital world and digital citizenship a reality for their own lives yes fight back and 100 percent women online um okay this was amazing and um, now we have a few minutes to take questions. Um, I would request Shruti to please uh, direct some questions to the panelists, if you will. Sure. Uh, I, I think Lucy answered the questions of Christy and Penelope both regarding the Foster Sister and also about how to include disabled and the LGBTQIA. Uh, I would first like to uh, ask her uh, I mean, I want to ask Lucy the question that Anne sent across, Anna Dilla. Uh, she says that in general, there is a fear and wish of protection in churches or religious spaces. Sometimes this happens in a higher level. Have you reached these kinds of institutions? Is there a plan or an idea to work on these areas? I'm thinking especially on those with youth group focuses who have a lot of plans and activities, but I haven't seen much of this approach uh, you proposed. Wow, that, that is a fantastic question. And I feel like there could be a, a worldwide global movement in that kind of conversation that um, sadly we're sort of divided by, I'm naming the obvious here, but um, when it comes to faith, um, yeah, I, I, I think that these the strength of, of religion is that it builds such communities and we can those can be can create inroads to education and access um, and participation. And at the same time, they can be so alienating for people. Um, in the organization that I run, we're an incredibly diverse organization. So I run a I have a team of about 20, so it's quite a small team. Um, but across our organization, there'd be, we have people of um, every different faith background that I can imagine. It's quite interesting when you find people in a room together, often they're people who have come from communities where these issues aren't openly discussed and engaged with. And so that's what motivates them to come to work, to do this actual work. Um, so I would say that I just think that's why I think it's really important that that work, this work is led within communities and by communities. Um, and one example I can speak to of this is a fantastic young team member at Project Rocket, um, who is a young Muslim woman 
um, who has, her community has been dis disproportionately affected by COVID, who's been a real advocate for using technology. She actually recently got poached from Project Rocket by our national broadcaster to be actually become a journalist because she's that sensational. And I think that just highlights that when young people are doing this work within their community, they can be recognized and elevated and celebrated for the way that they represent their kind of their faith background and their community. So this isn't quite answering your question. Um, we work in schools, so we work in a variety of, we work in every different faith-based con context educationally that exists. But I'll acknowledge that that, that is a bit uh, that is limited to, to kind of educational settings. But I do think there's real scope for people within communities to be really driving this conversation, especially when it comes to the kind of vitriol that we see playing out between faith-based groups online. And you know, we're also seeing a rise of interfaith communities um, on the internet as well. So yeah, long story short, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, I'm really lucky because I work in a a micro kind of organism that feels like this is kind of happening, but I just recognize that more widely, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and there's still a lot of division in our communities as well. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, I think the next question is from Carolina and that's to Madeline. And that is in addition to cyberbullying, there are other ways of violence against women in the digital world, such as discrimination. And this discrimination occurs when women can't participate in public life due to lack of connectivity. How do you think this can be attacked? How can we guarantee access to all women to digital media? We cannot guarantee access to all women at the digital media. Um, I think we're, it's, it's beyond the scope of this uh, discussion, um, but I think that uh, access is, is just a whole different, um, it, it needs infrastructure, it needs, uh, besides infrastructure, it needs, um, like we were talking, awareness raising, it needs, um, there's a lot that comes with it. So um, computers are expensive, mobile phones are expensive. Um, I mean, there are, the, the issue of accessibility is not an easy issue, um, but it's, it's one of the broader issues of women, in my view, um, so. Thank you so Thanks. much, Madeline. Yeah, and there is a question yeah. for um, you and one of our participants yeah. had asked it um, earlier. Yes. How important is stakeholder education, like training of parents and teachers in terms of online safety of children? Oh, I think it's absolutely essential because, you know, it takes a village, right? Education um, needs to come from every direction and go in every direction, I think. You know, one, one thought that I had that might be useful to think about is the way we're thinking about technology right now, the platforms we're using right now um, is changing. And um, we, we have some new challenges coming up. At one was brought up here in chat just recently about what people can, you know, what people's governments allow them to access, you know, and it, it, we're, we're seeing the internet splintering. We, we're, we've got, you know, China developing um, um, digital infrastructure in countries in its own image with um, firewalls and enabling governments to shut down the internet during elections. We have um, a lot of things happening that, um, you know, people are definitely wanting more and more control over their individual data, their personal data. And so we're seeing decentralized um, anonymous organizations developing on the blockchain where there's greater trans, well, transparency is guaranteed in many ways by the technology itself. And people are, you know, developing, um, you know, very sort of uh, networks where they control their data that are democratized. Um, and then, you know, of course, we're seeing more and more sort of smaller groups and encrypted um, technologies being used to protect people. And there's this 
tension now between privacy and safety in Europe. So a lot of things are happening that are kind of changing this environment that we're talking about. And I think um, there, it's not going to be sort of as, as monolithic as it has been. And I don't think the platforms are going to be quite as um, all powerful as they seem right now forever. <laughs> I agree. I agree with the and that you know it's going to be the next phase now, which is almost on the horizon with the, not only countries trying to develop their own technologies to, to and that's all towards the more control. It's yes. not real more democratization. That's the risk. The risk is that yes. it's towards more control, how they can control the voices of the people, how they can control mobility of the people. Yes. So anyway, so it's more not, uh, it's a control paradigm, which is we are moving into a, from more freedom and democracy. So I think that's where also the platforms nationally created might become a, a risk in the future for citizens. And the other thing which is very important here to uh, think about and we must start thinking about is AI. You know, yeah. the whole uh, development that we are seeing and the way AI is moving at the moment. I mean, it, it can not really just control the access and your uh, knowledge and everything, but even minds, even thought processes, even changing. I mean, we are already worried about how social media is changing the way people are thinking, behaving, uh, the way people are responding. But when AI comes in, then certainly it's going to be much more uh, than that. So you're absolutely right. I totally agree with you. AI is here. <laughs> AI is here. We need to ensure to... that it's ethical and we, we yeah, I, I think Lucy wanted to say something. Yes, oh, go ahead, Lucy. I was just going to jump in on the question about elders and the role of um, parents um, and older, like kinship kind of um, just to name that the technology is new, but the issues are old yeah. that we're seeing. And I think that technology can bewilder and terrify parents. Um, but adolescence is, is a rite of passage that we all go through. Um, and even from my perspective, um, when, I, when I started Project Rocket, I was fresh out of school and I didn't really know what I was doing. But I'm really lucky that I've had role models in my life like Anne and Dr. Kamari personally, I know very well, who have really been custodians of the online world for me and have guided me through understanding these issues. And so, you know, one of the conversations we have with parents quite frequently is your kids are the experts with the technology, but they don't know what they're doing when it comes to that big old wide world out there. And so if we put these two kind of forms of knowledge together, the new and the old, um, we've got a lot to learn from each other. And that's definitely been on a kind of macro level, that's been our experience at Project Rocket coming into this space as well. So yeah, I think that I have quite a hopeful view in terms of the importance of including, um, including people who are older than us um, through all stages of the lifespan um, because we've got so much to learn. And, you know, we're not, otherwise we're just gonna keep repeating our same mistakes. <laughs> Another thing that might be helpful to think about is that there's this whole, we need a big diverse toolbox of tools and thinking about the sort of the prevention and intervention spectrum of online safety. Um, you know, we have, there are platform tools like the machine learning algorithms that detect hate speech and such, but we also need helplines around the world. We need to build this layer of, um, that provides context to, um, the platforms which can't, whose you know, machine learning tools really can't understand the nuance of, of cultural context. We also need law enforcement and, and you know, content moderation and um, you know, parents and teachers. We need, all, we need to sort of flesh out the entire um, uh, system and um, all of the tools at our disposal and, and really kind of respect the different perspectives they come from. It has to be a kind of multi-stakeholder process, right? Multi-perspective, cross-disciplinary and very diverse in a lot of different ways or we won't be able to solve these complex problems, I don't think. 
So, uh, Jyoti, 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 if you allow, uh, there's just one question that's directed towards uh, Dr. Ranjana Kumari, and I think that's an important one. I think if you can answer it in a crisp way. Uh, you talked about the de facto exclusion and underrepresentation of women online. What can be the specific role of men and boys in an effort to create inclusive communities and an inclusive culture, both online and offline? This is asked by Sina. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Yes, uh, very, very interesting question. You know, how can you think of any, uh, any change without including men and boys? Uh, they, they have to be becoming, you know, they should become part of the solution. And that's the effort that uh, we all are making when we uh, have developed the projects, uh, including men and boys. I mean, they have to be, uh, we had a very famous uh, case of uh, boys locker room in India. I think if you all know about that case where they created a community. It's very important to create communities online where you can learn so much, exchange, you know, support each other. But this community of boys were really trying to, um, you know, plan to rape a classmate. And uh, this was, this really blasted everybody's mind that what is going on. And, but then after that, when we went to the schools and took this training, uh, safety online training to so many uh, schools which are run by government, and uh, these are government schools would mean in India that they are the uh, children of more underprivileged class who go to those schools and privileged class. This was coming from a privileged class school. So, but then it started changing the idea of uh, boys and they just, uh, many, many such trainings, they have said no, no to such experience. Of course, we have had very bad experience training boys online, but then once the training goes through and they go through the whole process of understanding that they have a very important role to play, then they change their perspective and their mindset. So I think that's where the solution lies, changing the way men and boys are looking at, uh, you know, and behaving and treating women and excluding women and, and pushing women out. So that's where their mindset has to change, I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, we're almost, we're at the end of the meeting. Although I would love for this to carry on for much, much longer. But um, thank you so much, Anne, Marilyn, Lucy, and Dr. Kumari. This has been very, very enlightening. I would also like to thank the global community which has joined and supported us from the US. There was someone from Ukraine, Australia, Indonesia, India, other parts of the world. Thank you for your participation. That's yeah. given strength to our efforts. I would like to add here that the inputs from this discussion will form a valuable part of our policy document which we will re uh, release and share with you soon. So don't forget to share your email addresses, everyone, before you leave. Give us a follow on social media and visit our website to stay updated on the latest from CSR. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye Thank you so much. By Lucy, because they'll close it. I, as I understand, they will immediately drop us. So it's better we close it ourselves. Bye, Anne. It was pleasure Bye. meeting you, Marilyn. Bye, of course. Everybody. As always. Thank Lucy. you. Such a pleasure. Good to see your faces. <laughs> bye. 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 And bye to everyone who joined. We really are very happy that you could find time to join this discussion. This is the first day of CSW. We have to go on till this ends and we can get into many, many such discourses during the whole of this week and next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.
फिनिश अब ये मैं बंद करूंगी तो आई थिंक रिकॉर्डिंग विल स्टार्ट डाउनलोडिंग ना मैं हैव यू सेव द चैट आई हैव सेव्ड द चैट मैंने यहां तो करा है यू आल्सो क्लिक ऑन दिस आई हैव सेव्ड एवरीथिंग आई हैव जस्ट कॉपी पेस्टेड इट इन अ वर्ड डॉक्यूमेंट अच्छा नहीं यहां पे ऑप्शन है चैट सेव हो गई है फोल्डर में आई थिंक चलो ग्रेट बंद करें सो आफ्टर इट्स डन आई थिंक उन्होंने बोला था कि एक मैक्सिमम वन डे में ये काम कर लो आई थिंक वेयर हु ऑल पैनलिस्ट के कंप्यूटर्स में अपने आप हो रहा है ये डाउनलोड सबके जहां जगह पे हो रहा था डाउनलोड जो जो पैनलिस्ट के लिस्ट में आए सो इवन अस हां ओके कूल आकांक्षा का नहीं हो रहा रिकॉर्ड आई कैन सी दैट है ना ओके चलो ऑलराइट कूल बाय बाय गुड नाइट गुड नाइट